name is John Griffin. Uh, welcome to today's seminar. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am a scientific manager in the research management team here at Gel, um, which is a team that interacts primarily with the academic and clinical researchers to support their work. Uh, we have two really exciting talks lined up today. But before we get into that, there's a couple of kind of housekeeping things that I want to mention and just a few items I want to point out about events that are coming up in the future. The first thing I should say is that this talk is actually being recorded. So hopefully you're okay with that. The seminar will be recorded. Like all of our seminars, it gets put up on our YouTube channel. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to look at our YouTube channel, I highly recommend it. There's a lot of great talks there from over the years. So it's really interesting. The second thing I would say is just to tell you that the seminar is an hour long. As I mentioned, we have two speakers today uh, and each speaker is followed by a Q&A session. Um, so if you have questions during the talk, please do feel free to put them into the Q&A feature in Zoom. Um, try not to put them into the general chat as we won't really check that during the Q&A session, put them into that dedicated Q&A um, feature. Um, and if you do have questions, you know, that you want to raise your hand for during the Q&A, um, that's also an option that we'll try to come to. Um, there were a couple of things we just wanted to bring to your attention before we get started. So one is that the Genomics England Research Summit for this year is coming up on the 9th of July in London. So this is obviously a really exciting um, event. It kind of showcases a lot of the research that's going on in our community. Um, and if you would be interested, if you'd like to submit an abstract for that to apply for either you know, uh, an oral presentation or a poster, um, you can do that now. Uh, and the deadline for abstracts is on the 9th of April. So please do consider putting in an abstract. We, as you probably know, we have also restructured our research community. So it's now composed of these eight complementary kind of cross-functional communities that you see here. Um, and for existing members, we really would encourage you to join up with some of these, at least one or more of these communities uh, that align with your research interests. So you'll recently have received an email uh, with a title, something along the lines of join your community. And if you look at that, there'll be a link that takes you to a form and you can pick the communities that are of most interest to you. It's a really good time to join them. There's a lot of kind of meetings around now um, about setting up the communities, about what the objectives of the communities can be um, and the kind of things the communities wanna work on going forward. So if you join now, um, it's a really good time, like I say, and you can have you know, a voice in shaping the communities and shaping our research community as we move forward, um, which would be great. We also have, so we have two leads in place for each of the communities and we're currently recruiting a third lead for each one. So if you would like to nominate yourself or if there's somebody else you think would be really good as a lead for a community, you can nominate them now. I think the link to that form is also in, um, might also be in that email or, or maybe Zan is gonna put it into the chat now. Um, so please do consider that. We have a lot of great blog posts on the Genomics England website. So we just wanna again, flag these to you. Um, in particular, there's two new ones that just went up. So one around the research network, which you just mentioned. So if you want to understand how that's structured or um, the advantages that it brings, um, please do look at this. Um, and there's another really exciting one that just went up as well about um, uh, ethics in genomic research. Um, so please do feel free to check those out. And the final thing I want to say before we get into today's talks are um, to bring your attention to the next research seminar which is gonna take place on the 30th of April. And this is a special seminar in that it is focused on two of the initiatives that we currently have at Genomics England. So we're gonna have a talk from the Cancer 2.0 program about long read and multimodal data. And then we'll also have an update from the generation study exploring um, newborn genome sequencing. So I think those are gonna be really interesting talks um, for, for all of us. And with that, I will stop talking. I'm just going to quickly introduce our speakers today. As I say, we have two. We have Sam and Zongo. Um, Sam is coming up first. Um, Sam is actually a, a genomic data scientist here at Genomics England, where he works largely on the Diverse Data Initiative. Uh, and his work really, I think, in the past has focused on um, the genetics of underrepresented populations uh, and kind of exploring that to better understand human genetic diversity and how we can improve healthcare outcomes for everybody. So with that, I'm just gonna hand it over to Sam uh, and uh, look forward to hearing your talk, Sam. Thank you very much. Just 
<laughs> okay. Is this is it? Is everyone see the slides? All good. That's good. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, guys. Um, so yeah. So um, thank you, guys, for inviting me to do this talk. So I'm Sam. I do work here at Genomics England on a diverse data initiative. So. Um, I'm sure I know plenty of people. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you a bit about my work that I've been doing on um, variant discovery for rare, rare, rare disorders and the impact of missing genetic diversity. So just a little bit of background on rare diseases, probably not needed in, in this audience, but it's always good to get a refresher. Um, so rare diseases are those that affect one person for every 2,000 births, roughly. And this is over 350,000 people living in the UK. So in reality, rare diseases are not necessarily that rare when accumulated in total. Um, most rare diseases are expected to be caused by alterations in DNA, and many expected to be primarily uh, monogen monogenic. Um, the phenotypic heterogeneity underlying many of these conditions uh, means that the pathogenic variants that we the kind of look for often are undiscovered using these standard genetic testing approaches which leaves a lot of room for discovery of, of of the underlying basis of a lot of conditions and and this is where whole genome sequencing comes in which kind of captures the full spectrum of 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 well most of the spectrum of of human variation and particularly for small variants and this kind of lead, leads to, leads to where we come in in genomics england but obviously that, that raises a question when you have you know 5 million variant, 3 billion base pairs. Um, this is kind of the whole genome in the Welcome Campus. Uh, how, how do you go from this millions and millions of um, uh, background variation, benign bystanders, to maybe one or two pathogenic variants in an individual? It's kind of like finding a needle in a haystack. Um, so this is where variant prioritization comes in. Um, these variant prioritization methods are kind of um, wide and, and variety. Um, but almost all of them are just configured to isolate a small subset of, of rare variants that are likely to cause rare Mendelian disease by phenotypes. And I'll come back to the notion of rare variants later because that kind of forms the basis of, of what I want to talk about. So I'll give an example of the, the prioritization pipeline that I used to kind of perform this research, which is the one that we used um, during the 100,000 Genomes Project and continues to be largely kind of largely utilized in its similar format um uh, for nhs gms and others um so this is for small variants so you start with this uh small variants many millions and then you ask some kind of rules like is it rare is it protein altering is it segregating appropriately um no it's filtered yes you can answer more questions like does it appear in the correct gene panel um no maybe that would be the kind of group of variants that you would look for um afterwards uh, for those who utilize U genomics england lingo this is kind of like a tier tier three variants yes uh you can go into um ask more questions about modes of inheritance and then maybe you can find a couple of variants hopefully just one that's kind of a really good kind of um uh, one that you want to send in to review and and hopefully that's the cause of the disease um so where does kind of my interest in this come in um working for diverse data well um, over many generations, um, human population structure has kind of emerged, which is basically um, just systematic differences in allele frequencies. And so you can see here just a uh, kind of example of this in a, a kind of simulation, right? Fisher simulation, where um, over, over generations, um, this is kind of quite a large population. You can see that frequencies don't tend to, that's kind of tend to diverge over time. But if you look at a small population, they fluctuate more readily. And you can just say that over time, human populations kind of the same allele say it's red allele maybe at a completely different frequency in one population to another and so when you're looking for prioritizing uh variants for rare disease the kind of first or one of the most primary things you want to see is is the variant rare a red is rare variants are the likely to be cause of rare disease both in terms of matching prevalence but also in just terms of population genetics you expect rare you expect many conditions that cause disease to be under strong purifying selection, you expect them to be kind of purged from the population within a few generations. So you look for these variants that are particularly rare. Um, and to do this, you utilize these large reference databases such as Nomad, and they're invaluable resources for this prioritization. Uh, many of them are growing in size. You can say many hundreds of thousands of genomes and exomes. 
and they they're kind of the databases that are queried at this early stage of many variant part almost every variant, like small variant prioritization method um and it's particularly important to have diverse data sets that you're querying because you can get these examples for example this variant looks rare if you look everywhere else but if you have a data from africa you can see it's actually common and so you can get rid of that uh, variant as an example of a potentially damaging disease causing variation one of the kind of major tenets that you would expect in these things is that humans are all pretty much genetically and biologically super similar so if a variant is common in one population uh, you expect a, a pathogenic variant to be rare everywhere you look regardless of the population with some notable exceptions in some cases but for the vast majority of cases you would expect this to be very rare uh, everywhere you look and so this stratification of allele frequencies means it's really important to collect as diverse a data set as possible um, but this is where uh, it's interesting because much of global genetic diversity is yet to be adequately surveyed even in these large databases a really good example came out recently this is from uh, med archive but um, uh, an example of a variant in a ttn2 gene which is almost it's extremely rare in nomad um, was prioritized as appears in ClinVar, often as VUS, but also as kind of maybe pathogenic variants. Is actually kind of, if, it, and it mostly is occurring in regions such as Oceanian uh, participants. And, and once they looked, they actually found that it's pretty common in Oceania, and in fact, is segregating in Neanderthals as well. So this is almost certainly not the cause of a particular disease. I think it's just a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or something like this. Um, and so these cases where it's clear that the populations are particularly distinct from those in nomad it's it, it, there's a lot less evidence to rule out the variant actually being common it's just artificially rare if you know what i mean um and this is going to be kind of more obscured by practices that are often utilized in medical genetics where certain ancestry groups are, are homogenized um so large very uh, very um genetically diverse regions such as africa can be homogenized so africa is actually super super diverse so in a diverse data team, we really want to understand this data gap, make sure that patients of all backgrounds have seen the same quality of genomics and personalized medicine. So in my research, I really wanted to check on the 100,000 Genomes Project, um, which is this amazing, you know, great resource for this and utilize and see what the impact of, um, uh, of this is. Can we find patterns indicative of, of similar things? So just to go through results. So uh just pca plot people may be familiar with this just kind of shows uh based on allele frequency differences um how individuals st are structured this is kind of like a small fraction of uh just kind of projecting this huge and multi-dimensional genotype matrix onto a 2d space um and so you can see there's considerable genetic structure so in one of these points is an individual and how closely you cluster on these in on these points tends to kind of conform to how genetically similar you are there's not necessarily true but um, there is kind of the, this is this is roughly the case, and so we can add more context to this. For example, by comparing the individuals' um, genetics to the populations in nomad um, that, that I was talking about. So you can see the vast majority of individuals appear as European. These kind of reflects what we would expect of the diversity of the, of the UK population. But you can notice that in in nomad, there's there's quite this considerable genetic structure that appears to be homogenized. So, like for example, Africa, as I was talking about. There's quite a significant structure here, um, and we can. Um, so, so one of the things I wanted to inter inter interrogate is: is can we kind of find out if utilizing these these kind of group groupings and just homogenizing populations is uh, could lead to misunderstandings or lead to down uh, lack of clarity? Um, so instead, we can compare to a say more diverse set of reference groups, and these are kind of like arbitrary in a case, right? Like you're 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 not really actually describing someone's ancestry you're just it's just dependent on how you label the reference groups or how the reference groups are uh, available so you can just use another one and and, and just say well, well let, let's try and investigate this using a kind of more diverse selection of individuals where you can see you can have uh, eastern africa separated from western africa and you can say um the philippines and east asian uh, yeah, remainder of east asia being separated for example so these are the kind of groups that i'll be investigating and so how does this genetic structure and diversity impact candidate variant discovery? So 
Um, we can say that a complex array of factors are likely to influence variant prioritization. So just the, the raw numbers of variants that we identify through this kind of process. In particular, things like family type, if you, if you have considering rules about disease and uh, uh, disease kind of co-segregation with, with an allele, having more family data and having actual disease co-segregation data means that you can be more precise with how you define a variant at that initial kind of step of um, if the variant is segregating in the family. Um, and um, so you can kind of put, put all of these into a big kind of description, descriptive um, uh, variables and kind of see if you can isolate maybe how how, how, the, how this, say, say the numbers of variants that you identify through these pipelines um, is different across different populations. And so this is what you can do. You can just regress out all of these other variables. And this, this model, I think, explains something like 95% of the variation in the numbers of uh, rare. So CPFEs is just including everything that we find through this kind of view. So basically rare protein altering variants segregating appropriately in the family, irrespective of if they appear in the panels or not, you can just take them all together. And you can see that there's kind of very notable just disparities um, in fact, every single, it's compared to the kind of majority Europe Northwest group, there's, there's differences everywhere, right? Significant differences. Um, and this is, for example, um, individuals of, of uh, the genetically similar to the populations with East Africa and the UK Biobank have three times more of these variants on average than than someone from, from uh, you know, it's genetically similar to Northwest Europe, if that would be like me. <laughs> um, and you can see that this is true even in with respect to different African populations. So if we were just looking at Africa collectively, this this kind of wouldn't be apparent. But so to, it's just kind of showing the kind of arbitrariness of this structure, but adding a bit more, I, I guess, contextual information to what's kind of what what's what's going on. And so um, this is pretty interesting. And so why is this why is this happening? Why well, I mentioned about Nomad? Well, you can kind of directly see the influence of Nomad by just saying, um, regardless of all of the different parameters, um, let's just look at the number of variants that are missing from nomads and the number of protein altering variants that are entirely missing that we don't find. And you can see this is pretty much highly correlated with the numbers of variants that are coming out of these pipelines, right? So um, the more variants that are missing, the more rare variants that you have, even if you interrogate each population um, like it's done, you interrogate each population, it's rare here, rare here, rare here, rare here. This is basically just correlated with the number of variants that are missing from nomads. And so you can see this considerable kind of genetic structure um, here. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, so for example, um, uh, so for example, you can see East Africans being a major outlier here as well. But you can also see, for example, something like this is going to be a kind of complex array of things going to influence this. For example, let's see the Ash people who are uh, like Ashkenazi have almost the fewest missing variants, the fewest of these variants coming out. There is the Ashkenazi specific reference group in Nomad. This is a population that has a lot of known kind of uh, a known bottleneck. This is what we observe as well. So you can expect that the vast majority of rare variation, which is present in Ashkenazi, maybe at elevated frequencies. And this is kind of, uh, therefore, there's much not much variation which we can find, which is not already present in this reference population. Um, yeah, if you look at Africa, you can see that there's kind of one African reference group in Nomad, but you can get quite distinct um, population histories within Africa, and this leads to kind of quite different um, levels of missingness. And there's probably, um, uh, and, and this is kind of clearly suggesting that Africa um, is, is not one homogenous reference group, and this influences these kind of things that we see if you just segregate it a little bit easier. But it's worth noting that these populations, even though um, I've been talking about it. This is this is inclusive of individuals that are, are, are not assigned, for example, to a, one of these ancestry groups or remaining participants. You can see this pattern is still the same. So discretizing it is just a way of contextualizing it, but it doesn't really matter. It's just a continuous um, thing. Um, the more missingness you have from Nomad, the relationship you have to the individuals in Nomad is going to influence the numbers of variants that, you, that, that occur. And which is going to be influenced by your ancestry, the dem demography of your ancestors. Um, and so what one of the things that you can see then is that we 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 suggested at the beginning that um kind of if 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 you if the variant is present in in nomad and it's rare, well, if you have less information about how rare the variant is, then it's probably more likely to actually be common. 
Um, and common variants are less likely to be deleterious just based on purifying selection. So a hypothesis to say is that uh, what we'd expect is that the, the, if we just kind of look, try and predict the deleteriousness of all of the variants that are being prioritized in each of these groups, we can see that this is kind of also correlated in, in these different missense effect predictors um, with the portion of these um, rare kind of CPAVs that are coming out that are uh, that are predicted to be deleterious. And so you can see um, largely this kind of clusters, and you can do this as continuum as well per individual. But here, just to add kind of, again, a little bit more context, you can see that individuals from East Africa tend to have a way lower proportion of, uh, a, sig a significantly lower proportion of their variants being deleterious in, in a way which really closely correlates with the missingness from Nomad. Um, so this, this kind of relationship is, is, is there, basically. And it's important to say this isn't just a, a fact, a function of how many individuals are in Nomad, but how how they're genetically similar to one another. So it's quite complicated, but essentially this is um, a way of suggesting that a lot of the variants that may be being prioritized aren't as rare as you think, whereas the variants that are in individuals who are kind of well represented in Nomad, like Europeans, that you're getting a lot of variants that are truly very rare and, and more, on average, more likely to be deleterious. So how does this impact downstream clinical interpretation? Well, let's look at just the variants that are within these gene panels that are kind of the ones that are assessed, but in clinical teams, you can see that um, numbers of um, CPOVs, you can see basically the exact same patterns. Um, with just looking at these ones, it's obviously far fewer, but there's uh, the, the kind of actual kind of output is exactly the same. Um, this is just a function of, as I said, the relationship to Nomad being in a gene panel or not is, is irrelevant to underlying um, kind of ancestry or unlike demography. Um, so individuals from East Africa have three times as many variants that are being under review than individuals from Europe. And this is related to their relationship to the population, to the individuals nomad. Um, yet if we look at how this influence is diagnostic yield, we can say like how 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 likely is it that um or uh, the at least one of these variants goes on to be assessed as pathogenic or likely pathogenic. Or if we assume that um it, we're capturing the true kind of variant if you're if you're from let's say a population that's ha having more variants that, that doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to find a true variant so it's kind of not not really too, too surprising that there isn't so much of a difference in the overall yield of these variants if you just take it as um a whole like the likelihood at least one is actually going to be pathogenic yet you get, do get a corresponding complete decrease in the predictive value so for example, even though there's no difference in the yield of these variants or very little independent difference when you try and model a range of other factors, um, say, for example, in, in individuals uh, for this Africa East group, 97% of the var variants that are being looked at are probably of the US or, or benign compared to obviously much higher proportion of variants that you look at in, in say, Europeans. Um, and so we can really kind of just drill this in um, by actually just looking and seeing, or oh, can we find examples of variants that are actually maybe common? Um, we can do this by kind of looking at another data set. So this is the genomic COVID-19 data set, which is another data set from the UK of 35,000 individuals. Um, and we can kind of uh, look and maybe calculate um, allele frequencies. We can adjust for the fact that there's the variation in sample size. So we can be kind of semi equally confident that a variant is um, above a, a particular frequency, even if you have a data set of 35,000 or a data set of 100, you can kind of just adjust the levels um, based on the numbers of individuals. And um, obviously, this means that you're going to capture maybe far fewer of these actual common variants, but you can kind of be equally confident that they are common. Um, and, and, and you can do this for all of the different variants. And what we can see is that if you look at the numbers of variants that are prioritized in the 100 in the 100,000 Genomes Project, um, there's kind of 11,000 or 1,000 distinct of these rare candidate protein altering variants that were below 0.1% in every population nomad, but were observed above, like 95% confident to be above 1% uh, in at least one of these groups. And you can see that, uh, and, all, and none of these were pathogenic, many were, were, were the US. Um, um, and 63% of these were in this East Africa group, which I'd highlighted as being a particular outlier. And almost uh, a large proportion of those were uh, completely absent in all of the other populations. 
So this is a good example of this um, a kind of case of an, indiv of an individual population which is quite underrepresented or homogenized. And if you look independently, then actually there's quite a lot of common variation. And, 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 and this would be therefore pretty informative if you are wanting to understand um, a particular disease related variant you'd want to understand how common it is in individuals who are kind of similarly ancestrally matched. And, and this just isn't being done um, for these individuals. And so that you get this corresponding kind of big decrease. And this is actually 10% of all variants in um, individuals with East African ancestry were actually are probably common. And it's actually probably more because I'm probably underrepresenting this and just the fact that we have so sort of few individuals um, here. Uh, so um, just a summary then, um, if imbalanced sampling of these data sets results in artificially rare candidate variants being prioritized in individuals who've ancestors are underrepresented, East African communities are particularly at risk, for example, owing to distinct allele frequency spectra and poor sampling. Africa is not a homogenous group. So when you do this kind of thing, you find these kind of factors. Um, variant assessment is clearly time consuming and these artificially rare variants more likely to be assessed as VUS, and this can lead to increased uncertainty in families. And so the solution is always just let's get more data and let's investigate them in more complex ways and more uh, reasonable ways. So thank you very much. Um, and I'm open to any questions. Thank you, Sam. <clears throat> that was really beautiful and, uh, and very, very interesting work. Um, yeah, let's take some questions, I think. Um, I'm going to start with a super naive one, but just because I just don't understand, but like building on this, then what are the next steps, or how do you actually kind of how do we improve the situation? Is it just that you, you sequence more diverse populations and kind of get you know identify those variants, or what's kind of happening? Yeah. yeah, so that would be the kind of the most that's the only way around it in 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 most cases is that um, you want to have as diverse a number of individuals as possible, um, but an easy thing, way around it is just to think about how we described ancestry at all. Um, so particularly in medical genetics, not to get into the loop of just saying, well, this individual is from Africa, therefore, you know, this looks really rare here, that you can kind of have a little bit more nuance to understand um, yeah. maybe. Um, and this is particularly true, for example, of individuals who whose ancestry may not match to particular categories or um, and, and you can start thinking of things maybe more localized. So does this, does this, does the individual variant here does it look similar to individuals that, for who we have information how does it is it structured and there is kind of more complex things that you could do there's certain methods that i'm kind of in the in the in the process of um testing out to see maybe if we can look at um leveraging um haplotype structure or surrounding variants um and kind of uh, looking at ancestry in far more complicated ways um, but I'll leave that for another another day to talk about. That was brilliant. Thank you. Uh, let me just see if we have any other questions. I think we have just a minute or two of time. Um, we have one, uh, which is, how do you define reference population when everyone or village in Africa is very diverse? Yeah, exactly. So this is the whole point, is that you can't really define what a reference population is. So one reference population may be say, for example, we want to compare with Nomad. So let's use the same way that Nomad did it, right? So then you just get, you use the same method, you use the same reference individuals, uh, which just you know, maybe were just labeled as being from Africa or having African ancestry or whatever it is. And then you just compare to that and you provide some sort of cutoff value and you, and you look at that. And you can compare this to things like ethnicity for example but these things are not one-to-one -one relationships there's co correlate complex things so absolutely in, in africa it's super super diverse um yeah. certain village you know, so so it, it's just it's just arbitrary is, is the is the real thing you can kind of, you can do some tweaking to say uh, and, and that's why you kind of need to be careful of how you talk about this these people are genetically similar to these people at this that i've labeled as this from this to this yeah. threshold value basically yeah and there was there's one other question which I guess is related to that, which is what's the discrepancy between self-reported ethnicity and what we know from big data sets and patterns? Yeah, so the, I, I was going to talk about that, but I didn't really have a huge amount of time. Um, so it depends again on 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 how ethnicity is collected. Um, so for example, self-reported ethnicity in the hundred K will be utilizing um NHS standardized ethnic categories 
those in some cases will maybe correspond really well to a group. Say, for example, individuals who are from Bangladesh, who are similar to people from Bangladesh in the UK buyback, like 99% of those individuals self-report as Bangladeshi, right? Um, but then if you go to Africa again, because the, the, the categories of black or black British African, that's going to depend on how how you segregate what 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 does Africa mean and and how does that and so looking at ethnicity in some cases, um, like is 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 useful. Um, obviously there's kind of mixed ethnic categories. There's Af categories like other ethnic group, and those are, you know, obviously as you would expect, super diverse genetically. So, um, or other European or other Asia. So you know how how to just how to match ethnic identity with. The limited numbers of ethnic groups that are provided a standard to then kind of a set of reference groups which are largely kind of just modeling constructs um there's a whole kind of other kettle of fish okay <clears throat> thank you like i say that was brilliant so thank you very very much um i think with that we can um move and welcome our second speaker speaker uh jongbo chen who's a postdoctoral fellow at the crick and at ucl and i think also a, a register uh, in neurology um, and her work is focused mostly on using transcriptomic data um, to understand neurodegenerative disorders and today she's going to as you can see here she's going to talk to us about her work on um, using long read sequencing to better understand the um, genetic causes of spinal cerebral ataxia type 4. so with that i'm going to hand it over welcome and, and thank you Thanks very much, John, for that introduction. And uh, thank you uh, to the organizers for inviting me to speak today. Um, can you see my screen? Okay. And and the laser pointer. All good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, so um, the work I'm presenting here today really comes from the collaboration between multiple groups internationally. And I'm really grateful for all the lab members and supervisors who work together uh, over the years to, to contribute towards this. So I was asked to speak today about our recent work on using adaptive long read sequencing to identify a causal variant responsible for spinal cerebellar ataxia type 4 or SCAR4. And this was featured in this month's issue of Movement Disorders. And I really just want to say that this work would not have been possible without data and findings generated by the 100,000 Genomes Project, which has been really invaluable resource in our research. And through this presentation, I'll also briefly just highlight a couple of other pieces of work which we were also privileged to use data from the research environment and share how these findings from these projects have also benefited our approach in diagnosing SCAR4. So briefly, uh, the majority of my work over the last few years have focused on hereditary ataxias. And these, for those not familiar, are a collection of genetically and um, clinically heterogeneous disorders characterized by the primary and predominant clinical syndrome of progressive incoordination from cerebellar dysfunction. And with advances in next generation sequencing, more than 300 associated genes have now been discovered, taking us away from the original Greenfield's path anatomical classification to a detailed molecular approach partitioned by age of onset that's currently used in clinical practice in the NHS National Genomic Test Directory. But despite these advances in terms of the plethora of genes discovered in ataxia and our understanding of the function of the genome, uh, the diagnostic yield for ataxia remains relatively low over the last decade. And from this study by uh, Damien Smedley and team, uh, looking at the pilot arm um, of the 100,000 Genomes Project, we can see that up to 75% of patients with hereditary ataxia go undiagnosed despite this high depth clinical grade whole genome sequencing. And there are probably lots of bottlenecks which have limited the diagnostic yield of hereditary ataxia. And uh, what I think is nice about the story with SCAR4 is it really exemplifies uh, what is limiting our understanding and diagnostic rate in these diseases. So the story for SCAR4 really began in Utah in the early 1990s. Professor Louis Ptarczyk uh, was a neurologist working in Utah at the time. And he followed up a large five generation family who were living in Utah with multiple members of the same family presented with ataxia in adulthood. And from genealogical records from um, the church, uh, the local church, it was found that this family had emigrated in the turn of the 19th century from southern Sweden as early founders in Utah. And I'll just show you, um, it might take a few seconds to load, a few videos of members of this family. So 28 members of the same family had presented with adult onset gait and limb ataxia. 
And then common finding all the affected individuals, which was um, very interesting, as you can see here, was a large fiber sensory axonal neuropathy early on in the disease course, in addition to gait and limb ataxia. So you can see in this individual is quite unsteady with both feet together. This individual had impaired sensation um, up to his uh, knees. And you can see here there's some gait ataxia, a broad gait, very ataxic gait, and he was very unsteady. And although all the patients I've shown in this video are male, uh, female members of the same family were equally as affected. So within this Utah five generation pedigree, it was clear that the disease was autosomal dominant. And the phenotype again was striking for an invariable sensory axonal neuropathy early on in the disease course. Very interestingly, another family under follow-up by Professor Kathy Matthews in Iowa also presented with late onset ataxia in their 50s. And again, these individuals also had the same sensory axonal neuropathy as well as a gait and limb ataxia. And provisional genealogical records were not able to link the two families, although the Iowa family was also of Swedish ancestry. And because so many members of the same family were affected, um, analysis showed very strong linkage to a small region, chromosome 16q22. And because of this typical clinical syndrome and the strong linkage, this um, clinical entity was designated spinal cerebellar ataxia type 4 or SCAR4, as this was only the fourth SCAR to be described in the literature. A few years down the line, another German family of Swedish ancestry was also found to present with a very similar phenotype, again of ataxia and uh, neuropathy, and that further narrowed down the region of linkage within the 16q22 region. Despite efforts to sequence the region, screening of CAG and non-CAG repeats within that same region, SCAR4 has effectively remained a diagnostic conundrum for the last 27 years. Really interestingly, within the same small chromosomal region, in 2000, a Japanese family was found to present with late onset ataxia as well without neuropathy. However, later on, this family was found to have a pentanucleotide repeat expansion within B1, which is now termed SCAR31 and is not present within the SCAR4 families. And last year, a CAG repeat expansion within another gene, FAP11, again within this chromosome 16q22 region, was found to be associated with late onset ataxia in two Chinese families. So um, just as a reminder, repeat expansion, disorder, repeat expansion disorders, repeat expansion disorders arise from short tandem repeats. And these are repetitive sequences of DNA, which arise uh, from DNA that's up to six base pairs in tandem. And when they're repeated above a certain pathogenic threshold, uh, it's associated with disease, so-called repeat expansion disorder. And what's interesting is that there is an enrichment for repeat expansion disorders, and these have been increasingly recognized to be a cause of ataxia, late onset ataxia in unsolved cohorts. And given two other repeat expansion ataxias are found in the same region of tight linkage in SCAR4, we hypothesize that the causative variant for SCAR4 is actually a repeat expansion within the 16q22 region, which has eluded detection by conventional sequencing methods over the last 25 years. And just as a reminder, um, some several different methods exist for um, detecting repeat expansion disorders. Conventionally, we see PCR, and more specifically, repeat prime PCR southern blotting uh, as the gold standard. More recently, work by Ariana Tucci and team using Expansion Hunter applied to um, whole genome sequencing data, that's short read within the 100,000 Genomes Project, have shown that uh, bioinformatic tools are able to detect and genotype STRs with some accuracy. And uh, in, in recent times, there's been the advent of long read genome sequencing. And given we have a area of strong linkage, we decided for this project to go straight for long read sequencing. And for those not familiar with long read sequencing, longer reads are able to span regions that are more complex, enabling a better detection of these repetitive regions. So here we decided to use the Oxford Nanopore Technologies platform and a double-stranded DNA, when we're talking about long read DNA sequencing, is unzipped and passes through these very small pores attached to a, a membrane. An electric current is passed across through the pore, and as the single-stranded DNA passes through the pore itself, each nucleotide disrupts the flow of current in a different way, allowing longer reads to be sequenced and read and recorded in real time. However, while long read sequencing is very accurate, it can be quite costly. 
And we wanted to take advantage of the fact we have a power, the power of a region of interest having strong linkage. And we know that there's a causative variant likely residing within that region of interest. So we went for a method uh, called adaptive sampling. And what this method does is it allows selection of a targeted region of interests, uh, which we define computationally and allows the targeting of this region of interest to be sequenced in real time. So when uh, the DNA matches a region of interest, which we input into um, the computer, uh, the sequence continu uh, sequencing continues through the pore, allowing that particular region of interest to be sequenced. However, when uh, the DNA that's passing through the pore doesn't really match the region of interest, the pore ejects the DNA uh, that it counters, and um, that increases the coverage of the region of interest as only allows sequencing of that particular region. And a detailed version of this protocol has been written up by Claire Anderson from the group, uh, and you can find it on protocols.io here. So in order to have um, to be able to do long read sequencing, we needed good quality DNA. And so in the end, we ended up extracting DNA from lymphoblastoid cell lines extracted from these patients over 25 years ago. We then ran the adaptive sequencing for the 16Q22 region of interest, which was found on linkage for both the Utah and Iowa families. And as we hypothesized, because we think that SCAR4 is secondary to repeat expansion, after the adaptive sampling and long read sequencing, we then ran a structural variant calling pipeline across um, the, the sequences that were generated. And uh, using this approach, we didn't have to specify um, a priori what type of variant we're looking for. We didn't have to say we're looking for CAG repeat and uh, then sequence that repeat. And we didn't have to filter through um, the particular sequences for a repeat that we were looking for. What we did was when structural variants were generated and called, we simply looked for segregating uh, structural variants um, in the cases compared to the controls. And through this, we found a candidate GGC repeat expansion within the last coding exon of this gene, which is a zinc finger homeobox X3 gene, homeobox 3 gene, ZFHX3. And we found uh, a repeat expansion, that's GGC, um, within the cases, but not within the controls. And because then we only had a handful of cases and controls, and given this disease we know is rare from a clinical perspective, uh, we have actually limited information about the repeat size in the normal population. And this is where um, data from the 100,000 Genomes Project came into use. And working with Ariana Tucci's group, uh, we reviewed the distribution of the repeat size within the normal population. And the team used a bioinformatic tool called Expansion Hunter, which estimates repeat sizes from short read whole genome sequencing data in order to estimate the GDC repeat size within the ZFHX3 gene. And what was nice is that because we know that this is probably prevalent in um, Swedish individual Swedish ancestry, we were able to segregate the repeat size data across different populations with different genetically determined ancestry. And what we found was that the repeat size, the GDC repeat size, did not really vary between the different populations. And invariably, in 99.9% .9 of cases, um, the average repeat, the median repeat size was 21. No repeat size um, was over um, a GDC repeat motif size of 31 units. And we found no uh, differences in the GDC repeat size between individuals with undiagnosed ataxia recruited in the 100,000 Genomes Project and neurologically normal controls. And in total, we had 803 individuals with undiagnosed ataxia and 21,836 neurologically control, normal controls from the 100,000 Genomes Project. So it just shows the utility of being able to estimate repeat sizes at the population level. So armed with this uh, data that helps with our segregation and armed with the strength and evidence, we deduce that a GDC repeat size of more than 40 at least seen within our data set is associated with SCAR4. And given the lack of repeat expansion in so many individual cases within the 100,000 Genomes Project and no other clinically similar cases described, we, uh, we postulated that this repeat expansion came about as a result of a Swedish founder effect. And just as an aside, population differences are a really interesting feature of some of the repeat expansion disorders where often we see a founder effect. And this is a project we did a few years ago also using 100,000 Genomes Project data. And this is exemplified in another disease called neuronal intranuclear inclusion disease, which again is a clinically and genetically heterogeneous disorder that converges pathologically on a common end goal of eosinophilic 
um, intranuclear inclusions in both neuronal and non-neuronal cells pathologically across all ancestries. What was interesting was despite this common pathological endpoint, a GDC repeat expansion and NOTCH2 and LC is found to be a very prevalent cause of NID within East Asian patients, but um, not really associated with disease in European patients where the disease tends to be more severe and early, of earlier onset. And working with Christina Ibanez, we were able to again use expansion hunter to size the GDC repeat expansion within NOTCH2 and LC across different populations. And through this, we found actually one individual and one of the only individuals characterized in the literature um, of European ancestry who had a um, five prime UTR GDC repeat expansion within uh, NOTCH2 and LC. So again, this shows the wealth of data that we have available, the 100,000 Genomes Project, shows the um, utility of bioinformatic tools that now made it tractable to estimate repeat sizes on a large population level and to appreciate the population differences when it comes to studying these disorders. So coming back to SCAR4, um, ZFHX3 is really interesting. It's involved in transcriptional regulation. It's a DNA binding protein. It has a range of biological functions, including neuronal development. And a recent single nuclear RNA sequencing study shows that this is actually a really important marker for um, neuronal cell types, which are specific for long range afferent projection from the spinal cord to the cerebellum to provide some plausibility for the similar onset of the sensory symptoms on top of the ataxia. And using the human, brain, uh, human protein atlas here, we can see that interestingly, there is um, quite cell type specific expression of the ZFHX3 protein within Purkinje cells, which are the main output cells of the cerebellum and affected um, in spinal cerebellar ataxias. Lastly, um, we wanted to address the quite intriguing question of why this small region, this small chromosome region, harbors repeat expansions associated with three late onset ataxias. And for this, I compiled a genomic map of all STRs within the genome that occur naturally using existing knowledge of um, the naturally occurring STRs estimated from um, other data sets. And as you can see in the orange here, looking specifically at the chromosome 16Q22.1 region, we see that this small region is really enriched for STRs that are naturally occurring and specifically CCG or GGC, um, depending on which strand STRs. And it's therefore unsurprising with hindsight that this region harbors several repeat expansion disorders as naturally there are lots of naturally occurring STRs within this region which have a propensity to expand and become unstable. And this is not really a new concept. Um, in a previous study, um, we've shown that there is a high density of naturally occurring short tandem repeats in both childhood and adult onset ataxia genes defined within the Genomics England panel lab. And again, here we applied whole, uh, Expansion Hunter to short read whole genome sequencing um, data to individuals with both ataxia and no ataxia enrolled in the 100,000 Genomes Project. And we found there was a trend for maximum repeat size in ataxia patients compared to those not affected uh, with ataxia. And this trend was appreciable but at both loci, STR loci, uh, known to cause repeat expansions and those naturally occurring uh, within the genome. And so this just demonstrates expansions of apparently benign STRs in known ataxia genes could be candidate pathogenic loci in an unsolved cohort. Um, and uh, this actually came to fruition because when we looked at the uh, number of unexplored STRs within known genes, we can see that there are about 5,000 STR loci within known ataxi genes as defined within panel lab that could potentially harbor pathogenic loci, including a, a large number of trinucleotide um, STRs. And when we rank the STR uh, genes that are known to cause ataxia by STR density, it really highlights and prioritizes genes in which there may be pathogenic repeat expansions for which we previously don't know. For example, here we can see CACNA1A is one of the genes with the highest density of short tandem repeats within its length. And we know that CACNA1A and point mutations in CACNA1A are associated with episodic ataxia, whereas repeat expansions associated with SCAR6. And similarly, we found this other gene, FGF14, in which point mutations are associated um, with SCAR27. But we postulated because it has such a high density of short tandem repeats, that it's also a candidate for pathogenic repeat expansion. 
And what was really cool was that um, study that came out at the end of 2022 in two separate journals showed a novel GAA intronic repeat expansion within FGF14, which we already know which point mutations cause GAR27, to be associated with a common cause of late onset cerebellar ataxia and across uh, several different populations. So this shows that looking at prioritizing known ataxia genes uh, with high density of STRs could be potential candidate pathogenic loci. So how does this relate to our work in SCAR4? So using the same approach, at looking at high density of STRs within a gene, we can see here shown in the horizontal dashed line, the ZFHX3 gene harbors a high density of naturally occurring STRs and exonic STRs compared to even other known ataxia genes within um, National Genomic Test Directory that are known to cause repeat expansion and ataxia genes which are not known to cause repeat expansion. So perhaps it's unsurprising given the high density of naturally occurring STRs within the ZFHX3 gene that it does harbor any pathogenic uh, repeat expansion associated with SCAR4. So uh, we basically characterized a novel exonic GGC repeat expansion ZFHX3 associated with SCAR4 and the original Utah pedigree in which linkage was characterized over 25 years ago. I think what this study shows uh, is a utility of using targeted long read sequencing um, to, to help solve other genetic disorders uh, with high linkage and underpins the new and emerging disease entity um, of polyglycine disorders. And you can read more about our work uh, in this paper. So I'd just like to finish off again by thanking all the uh, patients, our participants who've contributed time and samples uh, within this study and our collaborators and um, supervisors uh, in this project. Thank you. Thank you, that was beautiful as well. That's a great story and really nice work. Um, let's see, uh, do we have some questions? Um, let's see, there's one in the chat, which are, are different scars easy to tell apart clinically? And what do you make of the fact that most other scars involve um, CAG polyglutamine expansions? Um, yeah, I think that's, that's a really um, good question. I think um, CAG repeat expansion um, scars are more famous because um, they can count for about three quarters of the dominant adult onset um, ataxias. Um, and it doesn't mean that um, there are not a lot, there are lots of actually other different types of ataxias, but because these are more prevalent and because we're actually looking for them in diagnosed patients, um, that, you know, we're, we're actually um, seeing. Um, more of them so we think that most of the scars are scarred but actually there are loads of undiagnosed cases for example is it exemplified in a large proportion of late onset ataxias which has been explained by canvas and fgf14 which have been uh, found recently um so i think so i think definitely there are other um repeat expansion out there that, that could be found apart from the cag repeat expansions and in terms of uh, telling the different scars clinically i think we're still reverting to um, anita harding's previous classification of the autodominant um, uh, cerebellar ataxias into the one, two, three categories with the complex ones associated with the pyramidal features and peripheral neuropathy, um, the, scar, um, the pure ataxia such as SCAR6, and ones associated with maculopathy like SCAR7. So I think we've not moved beyond much beyond the phenotyping because these are such rare disorders. It's, it's difficult to diagnose purely on the clinical phenotype. But I think that's why uh, we now have the advantage of doing panels and to look for, for those genes simultaneously. Thank you. Um, somebody also asked, apologies if I missed it, but when you looked at the genes with a high number of naturally occurring STRs, did you take overall gene size into account? Good yeah, so um, this was actually a part of a, um, a wider study which used about 300 uh, functional genomic annotation features to characterize ataxia genes uh, from a functional genomic annotation point of view. So gene size was one of the features, including transcript size, number of exons, number of junctions within the gene, as well as other um, complex structural variation which were accounted for. And um, at the end of the study, we used all 300 genic features into an unsupervised um, clustering and also used that to, to look for the um, differences within those genes um, yeah. and, and that, that data is available um, uh, through the paper uh, if you're interested. Um, do you think the mechanism is a direct effect on um, ZFHX3, uh, for example, causing loss of function? Yeah, I think that's a really good question and 
I think in this study, we were limited essentially by the quality of DNA and the availability of DNA we had, even though there were lots of individuals who were affected, we only had availability of very little amount of DNA and no, no tissue. Um, and I guess one of the exciting things could be that because it's an exonic, one of the first exonic GGC repeat expansions, um, with other pathological evidence in another family that's been followed in Sweden showing intranuclear inclusions within um, post-mortem tissue, that whether this is a gain of function causing polyglycine disease. But I think this links also to the next question because GGC rich repeats often associated with hypermethylation causing uh, loss of function. So it, it, we've now gone back and we rerun the base calling to look at the methylation data. So it would be interesting to see whether um, it is, it's a balance and an interplay between the two. Finally, just out of curiosity, are there other variants in that gene that are caused, uh, you know, disease that are pathogenic, or do we know that? For ZFHX3, yeah. it's quite an interesting gene. Um, there's been studies um, showing that um, some deletion and syndromes associated with neurodevelopmental disorders, um, and actually it harbors uh, common variants associated with atrial fibrillation from atrial fibrillation GWAS studies. Okay. Um... Okay, and then one good time for one final question, um, which is, as you can see here, long read sequencing is expensive. Is this applicable to daily clinical practice as a point of care test to target a treatment in the future? Um, what's the, uh, the difference to short sequence or side sweep, sweep for example? Um, yeah, so it was expensive. However, I would say that we because of this adaptive sequencing approach, we were able to put um, several samples, four samples within one flow cell, because ultimately we're just looking for that one targeted region. And secondly, um, we we uh, skip the steps of using whole genome sequencing, then applying expansion hunter, which, which some other people have done to look for this repeat expansion. So we've, and then, then again, down the line, use long read, whole genome long read sequencing to point. So we've actually skipped those experimental steps and need to optimization for those steps. And lastly, we did try to PCR um, this repeat actually, but actually failed despite multiple attempts and the help from the clinical lab as well, because it is a very GC rich repeat, which may be why it's evaded diagnosis for so long. So I think, yes, it is expensive, but adaptive sampling helps reduce that cost. And uh, we managed to skip those steps before it, uh, including short, short read RNA, uh, DNA sequencing, effectively. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I think then we're just going to wrap up. We're going to thank the speakers. Thank you both very much. That was both beautiful, wonderful talks. Thank you. Um, really interesting. Um, and thank you all for all the attendees for your questions and your time. Um, and we'll say goodbye. Hopefully we'll see you next time on April 30th.